Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Future of XYZ. I want to welcome Francis Valentine all the way from New Zealand. Welcome to the Future of XYZ, Francis. Hi, Lisa. It is so great to be here. Um, well, it's such a pleasure to have you. We're going to be speaking about a topic you are an expert in, which is kind of the future of work, but we're going to be talking about specifically the future of upskilling. So how in a very changing dynamic world, both technologically, socially, environmentally, um, professionally, we can all remain our, at our very best. Um, and you obviously have quite a bit of experience doing this. You have founded multiple companies. You have a deep um, uh, and very recognized uh, experience as an educator and a technologist. Um, but you right now have co-founded and CEO of two different organizations, one the Mind Lab and one Tech Futures Lab. Um, if you could just quickly chat about those, I I'm curious how they play into this idea of upskilling the workforce for the future. Absolutely. So both Mind, the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab are graduate schools for professionals. So students uh, typically mid-career, somewhere around 40. Uh, students range typically 30 to 55. And they've come to a moment in their career when they realize they don't have all the answers and they're not sure how to navigate the road ahead. And part of the reason we have two brands is the Mind Lab focuses on people who work in impact areas. So maybe health, education, social services, um, not for profits. And then the people who work in study under Tech Futures Lab are working for profits for companies. And the reason we had to split them out is there's a very different economic argument that you have when you're working for something that's about impacting other people's lives versus how can we improve you know, the bottom line? So we, we have the two brands, but they kind of coincide as sort of sister organizations. And uh, here in New Zealand, and it's a, it's a national school, but also for internationals. Oh, that's fascinating. And, and I think you founded, um, Mind Lab started in 16, I believe, or in 13, and then the other one started in 16. So you obviously took that experience of working with the nonprofits and the people in the social sector, and then we we're able to leapfrog that into the fact that like people in corporations also need this. In fact, I think people in corporations probably need it more because they're actually held accountable for greater you know, strategic decision making and actually accountability for actually, you know, things that impact the bottom line quite heavily. So I think if you're working in a for profit, it, I think that the impact is, is greater if you don't keep up with what's going on in the world. It's absolutely true. And I, I guess that leads us to really quickly giving a definition of, of what is upskilling, actually. Look, if you think about it in a, in a more tactile term, if you, if you had a, an iPhone 5 and you kept that iPhone 5, eventually it, it kind of runs out of capacity to do anything pretty remarkable. It sort of plateaus because the processing has stopped. And so we upgrade our phones and we upgrade a lot of things in our lives. But the thing that actually makes us really reach our potential is our own upgrade. So it's an upskilling and upgrade is it's like it's saying you wouldn't want to, to buy a technology and never, never get a new download or a new app or a new feature. And so when someone hires you, it's about all the experience you've had until that point in time. The day after you're hired, you're self-depreciating if you don't keep learning. And it's like, a really hard thing. It's like a new car moving off the lot. It is, you know, suddenly you devalue immediately. <laughs> and so the value comes in saying, hey, I'm still engaged with these conversations. And as people start talking about the impact of change, and that could be technological, it could be environmental, it could be societal, you know, it could be about the demographic shifts in your customer base. If you don't understand them, then actually you're not able to really make those decisions, which will lead to better opportunities, you know, bigger growth, uh, benefits for your organization. So it's really about acknowledging and leaning into the idea that, we, we have a, a time-based knowledge that needs to be up, up, sort of upskilled and replaced on a regular basis. Well, it's quite remarkable. I mean, I, I want to come back to some of the major tenants that you've just outlined. But I mean, at the Mind Lab, for instance, again, you're based in New Zealand. I think I read in, in preparation for this call, Francis, that 4,500 teachers and over 250,000 students, kids, have gone through a program, which is really teaching them in, in some way to change the mindset and open themselves, right? It, it, that's, that's what it is. I mean, in a population that's not huge, that, those are big, big numbers. Um, what, is the, what do you think the like, main thing that they get out of this setting up for the future? Well, interesting enough, if we look at the children we taught, we don't teach children anymore. We stopped that quite a number of years ago. And that was really my first big aha moment you know this is my 25th year in education I thought maybe we start teaching young people around the technologies of their future 
what I realize is they're really good at that. They know how to go to YouTube. They self-teach. They, you know, they, they're kind of really motivated to kind of figure things out. But actually, when I started talking to their teachers, and the average teacher in most of the developed world, in the US, in New Zealand, in the UK, is 55 and female. So you have a, a really large number of these uh, middle-aged women teaching and actually have not necessarily upskilled for 30 years. So that was our very beginning in 2013, is like, how do we make sure that learning is relatable and accessible for those teachers? And so, yeah, in fact, we went on to even, uh, now I think it's just under 15% of the entire teaching workforce of our country has, has been upskilled through one of our postgrad programs. Amazing. Which is just phenomenal. But I think it's this idea that if you are, in those roles and you're looking ahead, if you can't really see with certainty what your li life and job will look like in a few years, that's where you really need to start thinking about wh where am I going and how will I get there? Well, and I think that's really when we talk about why does upskilling then matter? It's really about obsolescence and, and a depreciation of the asset that is you in the workforce, right? And as we said, there's a lot of reasons why this happens, but the world is changing faster and faster. I mean, I, I do this talk on change um, and risk assessment, you know, and it's basically like the disruption since, you know, the industrial revolution has been exponential, but we've now reached this moment and it's called the singularity. And I know you went to singularity university, but you know, yeah. where, where it's just, it's like you climb to the top of Everest and they hand you a jetpack and it just goes straight up. And that is the processing power. That is the technology. So we are all facing this. I mean, this is, this is not going to skip over any, group of persons so you know is that why upskilling matters or is, are there other reasons like what what do you think the impact is well i think there's two things the, the technologies you're talking about and, and they're very broad they, everything from you know artificial intelligence to that you're know, using data better to sensors and the internet of things and then pushing really into things like quantum computing they're all tools and i think we need to understand they are the tools of the time the same way i'm very poor at writing with a pen or you know, to, in, in a pencil these days because I type so much, you know, we need to keep progressing those skills that we have around the tools. I think the biggest shifts are the behavioral shifts that we're experiencing um, from the new generations. So Gen Z is the biggest population grouping in the history of the world. Yeah. We have, they've got very different values and motivations. And so they're changing the way we think about buying and working in the, in the future of work. We also have obviously significant challenges around sustainability and climate. And that is really going to impact all of us in a very short time. And I think we're only just starting to appreciate how much it's going to impact on our lives, not just our future, our grandchildren and in the future. And then we have this uncertainty about economics. And right now we have inflation around the world going crazy and interest rates going up and we have a war. So like it's not just one or two things. Like We, we are really in this position right now where there is a really big um, shifts happening and it's a little bit like the, the idea of if every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. There's this pendulum that happens in the world. And right now that pendulum is swinging because, and typically if you've gone sort of center right, you, you politically swing, swing to left. If you go fashion is all about free flowing and kind of like, you know, organic. And then suddenly it goes all structured. Like we do this naturally. We, we have this pendulum, but right now that pendulum is, is being influenced by so many factors and so many levers and so we have to kind of jump on and go, where do we fit? Where do yeah. we play in this new kind of new playground? And how it's absolutely true, but it is a daunting task, especially when you start getting into your 40s and 50s, right? Um, I mean, as you said, kids naturally self-educate. Even into your 30s, you know, people have this kind of more elastic mindset and this openness to change and learning. So how, how is upskilling done for, for the rest of us? It is about saying, putting that priority and maybe saying, I don't need a new car this year. I'm going to put a little bit of time and energy into spending some money on myself. The great thing, uh, if there is a great thing about COVID, is that actually it democratized education. So now there is availability of the very best institutes in the world that you can study on remotely. You can form collaborations with people within cohorts. You can, you know, you can do online and offline or blends of that. It is about prioritization and what I hear the most from adults and having been surrounded by adults and actually they're kind of growing up with me I sort of feel like every year I get older my students get a little bit older as well and, and that's it's, usually it's, the opposite by the way for yeah, I know which is really a, a great thing <laughs> but, but one of the things about what 
what is the thing, the catalyst that makes most people come to, into study? It's normally one of the things that you talked about. It's obsolescion, which is a terrible word. Redundancy, another terrible word. Yeah. Uh, death of a loved one, a really big one, particularly parents, where they suddenly realize at the top of, you know, at the top of the family and they want to make a real difference going forward. Children looking through their eyes of their kids. These sorts of life events often um, are a, sort of a catalyst for someone to go, I don't know that I have all the right skills. And they suddenly put that priority from midway down the list to the top of the list and say, okay, I might just do a three or four week part-time online course to see how I can get into this. And often what happens, it's like a muscle, your brain gets excited about learning again and it gets interested in the conversation shift and you get excited by those conversations and then people kind of delve further into it. And so it is a bit like the exercise, really. The more you do it, the more it becomes natural and it comes easier. It's the first step is that first step, like going to the gym. It's like, that's a big step. Once you're there, actually, I think learning becomes really easy for most people, yeah. uh, but they do have to find the time and time is, is tricky. It's a, it's a hard thing to find. Well, and it is, and it's, and it's, and you're trying to teach big things, right? There's this small, like three to four week course where you kind of dabble a little bit. I mean, I have a very good friend who's in her fifties and has always done PR communications, you know, and she went back and got a degree, like an online course certificate um, in, in, in digital marketing. So really the mechanisms of like placing a Facebook ad and, and, and paid Instagram and all of this, and it opened a whole new world that she was already playing in, but gave her confidence in a new way. She invested in that, she invested in herself and it's paid off in dividends. But as you said, it is a time commitment to, to do this work, um, you know, to, and, and you all provide these learning pathways for the self-development but how do you, how do organizations also, I mean, those are personal choices. Can organizations also provide that? I mean, 15% of New Zealand teachers have gone through, you know, one of your programs. That's remarkable. Is that the government who tells them to do that? And what, what is the kind of the play between self choice, um, you know, and self-determination and like getting the support that's needed from an employer? There's a few things there. So I think self-motivation is still the answer. You, you, you can, ask somebody to, to learn and they won't. You, you, they have to decide to learn. Interesting enough, uh, females always outnumber men in professional development. No surprise here. Yeah, <laughs> no surprise. And also universities right across the world now are seeing a lot more enrollments from females and, and less from men and males. So, so I think there is um, a higher awareness of limitations by women actually saying, okay, I do need to kind of re kind of re code myself, re kind of understand the world. So there's, there's that in terms of companies um, right now with the, the global talent crisis we're experiencing and trying to find people who really understand this, there is such demand that companies are upskilling their own staff at an increasing rate. They can't afford to lose people with experience. They need them to continue on with them. Generation Z or Z, they are coming into uh, the workforce. They're up to 25 years of age now, and they are so motivated by learning. It's their number one priority. So even higher than salaries, they see that as being the escalation or the, the kind of the catalyst to, to push them up to get better opportunities later in life. So the more they can learn. So I think it's a good business decision for businesses to say, I will invest. And then it's that really that, that coupling of the person willing, you know, willing student, willing employer. Um, but the good thing is if you add an element to your career, so perhaps you start to learn about data analytics or you get really really detailed understanding of sustainability practices or how you could change packaging or logistics to, to, to better utilize you know fleets that are less bad on the environment just one of those skills on your cv puts you into a different category like this is you know this isn't a real elevation of what you can do it's it's the deciding point between you and someone who looks the same on paper who's you know mid-40s similar backgrounds, similar study, but that one ingredient of, wow, you, you've been doing this learning and you've clearly know where the world is heading could be the difference of a you know, significant difference in pay, mm -hmm. but also in terms of your competitiveness in the market, if you're thinking about you know, continuing your journey. And the other big thing, which I talk about a lot is this idea of retirement around the age of 65 is nonsensical when we're living longer and longer yeah. and it's fair and reasonable that most people should be thinking they'll be living somewhere between 90 and 100 who are in the workforce today are children even longer 
I, I just read a statistic, actually, I just have to say, um, in preparation for something else the other day, and it said that the kids there who are being born today are likely to live to 150. I mean, some of them, yes, it's is- incredible. So my own children, I've you know, done, the, done the maths and they're in their 20s, and they the chance of the 50% chance they'll live to be more than 100. And of course, for every year that passes, that increases. And so this idea, if you if you retired at 65 and you have 35 years after you retire to do what? Right. Well, forget the financial impact of that without having right. the money to live. Actually, what, what will you actually do? Because everybody else will continue to move ahead. So we do have to get this idea of learning for longer. In fact, we, we even have scholarships for students who are over 60 years of age. And they are really highly contested. I bet they are. Somewhere. Yeah, because, you know, it's just like I want to keep learning and I want to be engaged with the world. Well, and I think that's exactly what it is. It is a level of engagement. As you say, in your in your working absolute working years, you taking something on, learning a new skill makes you much more valuable and competitive in the workforce. But I recall my grandfather at age 90 saying the hardest thing for him about, you know, no longer being in the workforce and being the age he was, was the the sense of not being needed, you know, and again, healthy mind, healthy body, healthy heart, you know, and you do want that. So I think that's a wonderful initiative. Um, what are some of the barriers? I mean, you know, if this is being recognized, especially in light of the great resignation and trouble finding, you know, um, people to employ and the, the onus being a little bit perhaps on companies more and more, as well as on each of us, what, what are some of the barriers to getting upskilled? Uh, so the, the biggest one of them all is um, where you've got people who don't think they can do it. They're really fearful that perhaps they will not be as good as they think as a student. Mm. We have a lot of high achieving adults in the workforce. And actually this idea that you're going back in to be measured against others is actually quite terrifying. And so, for example, for us, what we really focused on was uh, the ability to do competency-based learning as opposed to rating. You know, you're a a 75% student or an A student because actually by the time you're an adult, you're not there for the grades. You're there about being competent or not. So we we had to really learn about this. This is an idea that we we don't have the ability just to um, let people come in and and feel good about learning. A lot of people self-doubt. There's this whole imposter syndrome that comes about really quickly when you become an adult. So that's the number one barrier, I think. And then the other one, of course, is cost. You know, there's a lot of people who just don't have the, the available resources to pay for study. And, and so it's about looking for opportunities for scholarships or free learning online. You know, there are different ways of doing it. And again, this democratization of learning has really helped that. It's, it's really remarkable. As we kind of like start thinking about wrapping up, I think one of the things that has come up uh, in a lot of the, the language that you all put out there is about cultural adaptation you know, which is, again, that human mindset shift that is so relevant. Um, and, and I think your biggest passion is kind of helping people uncover what they're capable of. Um, when, it, when you think about the future and you think about, forget the future of work for a sec, but the future of upskilling, what is your greatest hope and aspiration? I think to normalize it, this lifelong learning terminology has been around forever. And I think what I would love to see is that we don't think about for front loading our life and saying, hey, by 22, we're good to go for life. I really love this idea that people will have these sabbaticals built in. And when they think of a career, they'll stop at the end of each role they have and take time out, learn, think about where, reflect about where they would like to be, connect with new networks of people so they can grow about who they know, the, the, the context of different conversations. And actually having this idea that a six month sabbatical is built into maybe every five to 10 years of your career so that you really do have time to reflect on what you've done and what you want to do. For me, the greatest thing about learning is you suddenly immersed amongst people who are very different than yourself. If you're an adult learner, the chances are you're gonna be in a class of people from you know, 20 different industries who have got 20 different life experiences and different cultures, different backgrounds. And so instead of being really overly indexed by the same people around you in the same company who have got the same degree, you suddenly have this expansive expensive mode. And it means that some people will end up in totally different careers because they'll suddenly reflect and go, you know what, I've been in health for the last 22 years. I'm not sure I want to be in health anymore. And I really am interested in, in perhaps going and being requalified or reskilled in a totally different area. And they might say, I want to go and work in social services, or I might want to go and become an artist. It could be anything. anything. This idea that it could be a, a different uh, 
pathway, a sort of a more squiggly pathway as a career, as opposed to this linear, we just do the same predictable thing from the beginning to the end, and then we retire. Uh, and I really hope that will happen. If, you know, and I think it is happening already. I think it's happening as we as we all kind of adapt to the pressures that are around us. You, you, as we close, wrote a book that just came out called Future You. I think it's available on Amazon. Um, it is. I'll do a little bit of plug. There it is. Back to front look. Look at that. Future there, You. Sure. Nice and simple. <laughs> and and it's really what's the subtitle? Be curious and open to change. And say yes to change. And say so, yes to change. Which is, you know, if you say yes to things, it's amazing what can happen. And that was really part of my philosophy. If you just say yes. Uh, actually is a lot of good things can happen in, in your life. It's absolutely true. Well, Francis Valentine, thank you for joining us on Future of XYZ today. It has been uh, a, an honor as well as really, really interesting and informative. Uh, it's uh, obvious you have a passion for this and, uh, and a great uh, advocate for learning and change. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's been great. Great to meet you too. Um, everyone, thanks for listening to Future of XYZ. Uh, as you probably already know, you can subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. Make sure also to follow us on Instagram at Future of XYZ or visit future of XYZ uh, to nominate yourself or someone else as a guest or learn more about LVG and Co. Francis, it's been a pleasure. Good luck with that book and everything exciting that you have going on in New Zealand. I see the sun rising. So uh, it's, uh, it's time. <laughs> it is time to rise. You're right. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye. See you.